How do you do? Uh, my name is William H. Amazing, and it's my very pleasant duty to welcome you here, on behalf of YouTube and There Will Be FUD, to an in-depth look at Disney's third animated feature, the musical sensation, Fantasia. Now, Fantasia is not an easy film about which to make a video essay, mostly because the film itself functions something like a video essay already. It takes well-known works of art, in this case, classical music, discusses their creation and historical impact, and then offers its own hypothesis about what each piece might mean, with accompanying visuals to support its points. At times, it seeks to illuminate the original vision of the artist. At others, it offers an alternative interpretation, showing how the work can take on new meanings for each viewer regardless of the author's intent. But ultimately, its goal is to deepen our appreciation of the art form itself, to make it accessible to new generations, and to attempt to capture in words what formerly existed only in the shared emotional experience of the audience. This is the primary purpose of Fantasia, at least according to esteemed music critic Deems Taylor, who acts as the film's MC. And since Taylor pops up at the beginning of each segment to explain the meaning of what we're about to see, it would seem there's not much more we can gain from additional analysis. Nevertheless, here we are. So let's give it a go. Who knows? Maybe we'll find something new. Walt Disney never intended Fantasia to be a traditional movie-going experience, but rather a unique theatrical showcase in a constant state of evolution. He imagined it as an annual roadshow where each year new short films would play alongside the old, touring the country in select theaters with specially trained staff and choreographed curtain and lighting cues. He even proposed sensory enhancements like 3D, smell vision and surround sound to create a completely immersive experience. Few of these ideas had ever before been attempted in film, and many had to be abandoned early in production, but not all. The film did indeed have a high-profile roadshow tour, and its stereophonic sound system would go on to revolutionize the way movies were shown. But at the time, these innovations only served to backfire on Disney and turn the film into a disastrous financial flop. Theaters couldn't afford to host a film with such elaborate screening requirements, and audiences couldn't afford the premium ticket prices while they were already rationing for war. After disappointing initial returns, Disney's backers pulled the film from its tour, cut over 40 minutes from its runtime, and re-released it as the second half of a double bill with a forgotten Lucille Ball western. Walt's dream of an ever-evolving cinema experience died almost before it began, going unrealized until Fantasia 2000, 33 years after his death. Still, there were subsequent Disney films that looked an awful lot like Fantasia. In the early 40s, with funding low and half of their staff on strike, Disney Animation launched what would later become known as the Package Era, a series of six anthology cartoon collections released as theatrical features to save money. Two of these features, Make Mine Music and Melody Time, do pretty much the same thing Fantasia did, pairing animated shorts with popular music to explore the relationship between the two art forms. In fact, a few of their sequences were even recycled from Fantasia's cutting room floor. Structurally, these films could be considered unofficial sequels to Fantasia, but neither has had the same lasting impact, and many of their shorts have since been extracted and sold separately on other home video compilations. So why, I wonder, hasn't the same thing happened to the original concert feature? Why has this film maintained its reputation as a one-of-a-kind masterpiece, while virtually identical films are dismissed as money-saving scams? What, at the end of the day, separates Fantasia from any other collection of musical cartoons you might watch in a single sitting? Greetings, music lovers! <laughs> well, if you ask me, it's not because Fantasia features better music, or stronger animation, or a more experimental style, though all that is true. It's because of the way Fantasia feels. It feels like one story, a single, unified experience with a beginning, a middle, and an end. But if you haven't seen it in a while, you might have forgotten this. Maybe you remember liking the part with Mickey Mouse, or the dinosaurs, or one or two other scenes, but the film as a whole probably doesn't hold the same special place in your heart that you reserve for other Disney classics. And with the longest runtime of any Disney cartoon, it's probably not going to be the first one you go back to for a rewatch either. And so, slowly, it fades from your memory. Just a cute little movie that helped introduce you to classical music, but not one you'd ever think of as a personal favorite. And if I am describing you, dear viewer, then strap in, because I'm about to set you straight. 
I refuse to accept your indifference to this film, and I will not rest until I'm certain that you love it as much as I do. So for the next 40 minutes, you and I are going on a journey together. And rest assured, by the time we're done, you will love Fantasia. The idea for Fantasia began when Disney asked world-famous composer Leopold Stokowski to collaborate with him on a Mickey Mouse cartoon set to The Sorcerer's Apprentice. He hired out a full orchestra and put his best people on the job, so it quickly became too expensive to sell as a standalone short. It was instead expanded into an anthology picture, and the further it progressed, the more it evolved beyond its cartoon origins into a mature work of art. Now, the most logical way to structure the film would have been to follow this same trajectory. Start with Sorcerer's Apprentice, hook us in with a popular character, and then, once we understand the premise, take us into the more adult pieces. Instead, Disney takes the opposite approach and opens the film with its most challenging selection, the Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. With this, Disney makes his intentions clear. He's not just teaching kids how to appreciate music, but also teaching music snobs how to appreciate cartoons. Therefore, the Takata and Fugue begins without any animation at all, and simply lets us imagine ourselves listening to the piece in a concert hall. It then slowly reveals the ways our minds paint pictures to music as we listen. First, color comes into play, then changes in size and perspective. And finally, the musicians drift away and let our imaginations take over, but the imagery still remains tied to the instruments. Strings become shadows, bows become bolts of lightning. What we see is just a way of visualizing what we hear, and the story never runs any deeper than that. But what it does do is allow us to fill in the story beats ourselves. A key collaborator on this sequence was the celebrated abstract animator Oscar Fischinger, and his early storyboards look a lot like the cartoons he'd made up to that point, with complex geometric patterns that followed the music but avoided any sense of meaning or continuity. But Disney didn't like this style and eventually parted ways with Fischinger, instead moving the film into a new artistic form somewhere between the realms of the conceptual and the concrete. Said Disney, We don't want to follow what anyone else has done in the abstract. We have never dealt in the abstract. We have given things a reason for existing and tried to convince the audience that it could happen, or was possible. I think even in this, if we take the soundtrack and use that and build through on that, it furnishes a reason for what we are doing on the screen. So the Takata that we end up with still has no literal plot, but does in its own way take us through the emotions of one, utilizing a visual language familiar to Disney fans. As a kid, this was my favorite part of the film, because I loved projecting personalities and agendas onto the seemingly meaningless shapes and figures. Like, okay, look at this guy. He's a walking piece of fudge with less than 10 seconds of screen time, but you can tell that wherever he's going, he's up to no good. In fact, when I think of my favorite Disney villains, he's one of the first that comes to mind. Or here's another one, look at this. We're marching through an empty, barren landscape when suddenly... Two characters meet, and with their union, life and vitality begin to trickle back into the world around them. So in this way, the opening of Fantasia is not all that different from the opening of, say, The Lion King. The lyrics to Circle of Life likewise offer no literal explanation of what we see on screen, but we can tell from the emotional swells of the music what each image is supposed to represent. We know that we're witnessing some sort of coronation, that this is a royal family, these are their subjects, this is a herald, this is a religious elder, and this will be the hero. None of these things look the way they do in reality, but they're close enough that we can figure it out without much difficulty. Likewise, when we watch the Takata and Fugue, we can tell that this is a villain, this is an army, this is a journey, these are obstacles, and this is the destination. The only difference between these two openings is that Lion King proceeds to tell a full story with these same characters, thus confirming our initial interpretations, whereas Fantasia abandons these images and moves on to new stories, leaving us uncertain as to the meaning of what we've just seen. Or does it? Let's look at the second piece, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite presented as a study of nature through the passing of each season. Walt had attempted something similar to this with four of his earliest silly symphonies, the first of which, Springtime, even features music from the Dance of the Hours, a future Fantasia selection. It also features this. Wow. 
which isn't related to anything, I just think it's cute. But to compare any image from these shorts to its equivalent shot from Fantasia is an exercise in contrasts. The effects and textures on display here are so evocative of real life that you almost forget you're watching a fantasy. I won't get too deep into the technical details, but just for an example, look at these snowflakes. To create this shot, the FX team had to drive outside Los Angeles to a blizzard, capture real snowflakes one at a time under a microscope, bring the photos back to the studio, trace them onto cells, cut each individually detailed flake out of the plastic, attach them to a revolving camera track, and shoot them in stop motion one frame at a time. They were then printed onto photocopies and given to the animators who drew fairies into the center of each flake, before being transferred back to cells and then merged back onto the original stop-motion footage for the final shot. Altogether, this makes up only about 20 seconds of the finished film, and it's just one of many equally complicated effects in this sequence. But as far as the storytelling goes, what's important here is that the film is easing us into more definite imagery. We still don't have a plot, but everything we see has a tangible, real-world equivalent. Flowers and trees, rather than just shapes and shadows. We even get our first clearly defined character, a dancing Chinese mushroom by the name of... Hop Lo. Yeah, Fantasia does not get any points for cultural sensitivity, we'll get into that more later. But this little guy is an important character, both for the film and for the history of animation, because he shows the way that a skilled animator can infuse personality into just about anything. He doesn't have a face, or hands, or any dialogue, but based solely on the way he moves, we completely understand who he is. A vain little prince who thinks he's the most important person in the world, even though he hasn't quite learned how to keep up with the grown-ups yet. And unlike in the Takata and Fugue, this time there's no doubt that we're interpreting the character exactly as the animators intended. So we've moved a little bit closer to a literal story, and therefore, instead of just responding to the mood of the piece, we can start to recognize and articulate certain themes. The passing of time, the cycles of nature, the death of the old and rebirth of the new. But wait, haven't we seen that before? And what about that? It's a different story, different music, and yet several of these images seem to be directly evoking those of the Takata and Fugue. So now these two shorts are in conversation with one another, and we must ask what they're saying. If this shot is celebrating the arrival of winter, what does that say about this shot, which looks very similar but is set to much darker music? Is it suggesting that winter brings sorrow as well as beauty? Maybe. I don't know, it might just be a coincidence, but by structuring the film as he does, Disney is inviting us to find the connections regardless. He wants us to begin by thinking in the abstract so that by the time we get to the literal, we're already searching for a deeper meaning in everything we see. And therefore, I don't think it's at all a stretch to look for recurrent themes and motifs that weren't overtly intended. Rather, I think that by its very nature, Fantasia wants to be dissected and overanalyzed, just as the animators dissected and overanalyzed the music. This is not just another anthology film. There's a story unfolding here, even if we don't quite know what it is yet. Like Walt said, there must be a reason for what we are doing on the screen. <laughs> So now we get to the one that started it all, The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Paul Dukas. Deems Taylor stated that this was the most ambitious piece of music Disney had ever used, and this is the first time in the film that the animators stick to the story the composer had intended, with one notable update, that being the choice of protagonist. Mickey Mouse's popularity was starting to wane by 1940, mostly due to the rising success of Donald Duck, and Disney wanted a project to put him back on top. Stokowski was against using Mickey, at one point writing a letter to Walt suggesting that the audience might find an original character more relatable, but Disney wasn't having it. He'd always seen the mouse as something of a surrogate for himself, and took great pride in providing the character's voice. Yeah, <laughs> it's me I guess. <laughs> and you can tell from his notes for this sequence that he felt a similar kinship to the character of The Apprentice. It is the picture of the typical little man, said Disney, and what he would like to do once given complete control of the Earth and its elements. Walt had just released Snow White to unprecedented success, and now he was going to use that success to raise animation into the realm of fine art. So it's easy to see why he would relate to a small underdog standing atop a mountain controlling the heavens. 
Who else could possibly play the part but his own avatar, the character who represented all the ideals upon which he had built his legacy? And it's through the casting of Mickey that the true story of Fantasia is revealed. You see, up until this point, the music has only suggested the imagery, but here the two ideas become one. When Mickey attacks a broom with an axe, we don't just hear clashing cymbals to emphasize each chop, we hear the chops themselves. The synchronization is so seamless that it almost feels as if the music couldn't have existed without the animation, and the fusion of sound and story come to a head with a sound effect that you'd never expect to hear in a song from the 1800s. Just as the piece is reaching its climax, with all hope lost and the magic out of control, the apprentice screams out for help. And what do we hear? Not the high-pitched wail of a trumpet, we hear the unmistakable voice of Mickey Mouse. It's perfect. It sounds just like Mickey, there's no one else it could be. And yet it's the exact same note that Dukas wrote on his sheet music decades before Mickey even existed. Disney didn't change a thing. But somehow he made a piece of art so inseparable from the music that you could swear the animation must have come first. Because why else would Dukas have made the protagonist of his piece sound just like a cartoon mouse? Disney isn't just showing us that animation can be equal to music, he's taking the music over. He's making sure that we never again listen to the Sorcerer's Apprentice without hearing the voice of Mickey, and by extension, the voice of Walt Disney. So now for the first time, the film is telling a concrete story, and it's the story of Disney himself, the typical little man who thinks he's ready to perform with the masters. And once again, the film uses visual symmetry to connect this segment back to the ones that preceded it. The apprentice is not unlike the little prince, who fancies himself in charge even though he can't keep step with his elders. Nor is he unlike the great conductor, who showed such control over his orchestra at the beginning but quickly got swallowed up by the unstoppable force of the music. And ironically, Disney suffered the same fate with Fantasia, taking on too much too soon until it all came crashing down. The world wasn't ready for his great experimental feature, and the humbled cartoonist had to pick up his old materials and go back to making the simple fairy tales for which he was known. But as he leaves, he turns back for a moment and smiles. He knows he created something wonderful, even if he wasn't ready to control it just yet. And more importantly, he knows he's gotten his master's attention. Someday the old maestro will step down, and for the little man ready to take his place, there will be whole worlds to conquer. So there you have it. The story of Fantasia is the story of Walt Disney. So where do we go from here? Well, how does the dawn of time sound? How does the dawn of time sound? That's the question the next segment sets out to answer. Rite of Spring was an unexpected choice for the film, having debuted not during the classical era, but as a highly controversial ballet in 1913. And its composer, Igor Stravinsky, was not only still living, but heavily involved in Fantasia's production. He didn't much care for Disney's eventual treatment of his work, but he felt that it was open to interpretation, and encouraged Walt to pursue his own ideas. Taylor and Stokowski both had mixed feelings on the piece, saying that the music had potential but would only work if the animation could properly capture its epic scope. And boy oh boy, does Disney deliver. Beating Stanley Kubrick to the punch by three decades, Rite of Spring takes us on a sprawling space odyssey, from the creation of the cosmos to the fall of the dinosaurs, only stopping there because Walt was worried creationist groups would boycott the film if it depicted the dawn of man. It was unlike anything the world had seen and was shown in science classes for decades after. This may seem silly to us now, given some of its scientific inaccuracies. We now know, for example, that the Tyrannosaurus Rex didn't even exist until about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus. Chronologically, it would have been more accurate to have the T-Rex fight Timothy Chalamet. But it wasn't the technical facts of the film that so impressed the academic community. When the New York Academy of Science asked for a private screening of the short, it wasn't because they thought Disney had access to any secret facts or figures. It was because, despite all their fossils and research and carbon dating, they had never gotten to see how dinosaurs would have actually moved. And nobody, and I mean nobody, understood the science of motion better than the Disney animators. 
Before Fantasia, dinosaurs were either friendly cartoon characters or flimsy stop-motion creations. Even in a special effects masterpiece like King Kong, they're fun and scary, but they still don't have any real weight. Disney's dinosaurs had weight. These titans shake the earth with their footsteps. They kill with a motionless animal instinct. There's no humanity in their eyes, none of that cutesy cartoon personification. There are real, bona fide monsters that roamed the very earth upon which we walk, and for the first time, someone had brought them to life for mankind to see. There's never been another animated film that makes dinosaurs feel as real as this one, and the immense power of these creatures only becomes more potent once they start dying off. When their world dries up and they look helplessly towards the sun as the last of their life drains away. When the same beast who reigned as king a few scenes earlier falls down dead and the others don't even stop to notice. When the earth rips itself apart to erase all traces of their existence and make way for new kings to take their place on the throne. Think you're the top dog now? Wait a few million years and see what time has in store for you. Sooner or later, the waves will come to sweep you away just like they swept away the last little guy. So enjoy your rain while it lasts, but remember that time stops for no one. The seasons will come and go as they always do, and the music will still be playing long after you're gone. And now we'll have a 15 minute intermission. Uh, hi everyone, um, so... Speaking of overly ambitious little guys who took on way more than they could handle, you may have noticed that we're only halfway through Fantasia and this video is almost over. Yeah, it turns out I made it way too long and YouTube's copyright bots are not going to let it through in one piece, so please check out part 2 by clicking the link in the corner or in the description, and if you feel so inclined, leave a comment or a like on part 1 before you go, that'd really help me out a lot. Alright, uh, thank you all for your support, and I'll see you on Mount Olympus for part 2.